Hey folks, it's Rose. I'm bringing this article to your attention because I want to talk about NASA and their um, launch, which is going to happen March 14th, if weather permits. And the story goes, and this is a uh, space.com site, the story goes, NASA rocket barrage to study winds at edge of space. NASA is gearing up to launch a fuselage of five rockets in five minutes next week on a mission to probe fast-moving winds near the edge of space. The small suborbital rockets from the core of the Anomalous Transport Rocket Experiment, or ATREX, which is scheduled to blast off from NASA's Wallops Flight Facility in Virginia on March 14th, according to a mission profile. The mission will gather information about the high altitude jet stream which whistles along 60 to 65, 97 to 105 kilometers above our planet's surface. If all goes as planned, the five Atrex sounding rockets will launch within 320 seconds, releasing chemical tracers into the high altitude jet stream. The tracers will then form milky white clouds allowing scientists to track the atmospheric region's winds, which can exceed 300 miles per hour. So here we go with some more government testing. It says, Skywatchers along the eastern seaboard may be able to see the action too if they have clear weather and unobstructed views, NASA, NASA officials said. And there's a nice little picture of uh, where they're launching from and their trajectories and the viewing areas. Observers from New York, I'm sorry, North Carolina to Southern New York should be able to see the five rockets streak towards space. The tracers, meanwhile, may be visible for up to 20 minutes after liftoff from South Carolina through much of New England, officials added. I'll put links below to this article. It talks a little bit more about what the jet stream does and that the high altitude jet stream is located in the same atmospheric region where some strong electrical currents occur. And this part of the ionosphere therefore has a lot of electrical turbulence which can disrupt satellite and radio communications, researchers said. While all five rockets will release chemical tracers at the edge of space, two of them will also carry instruments that will measure temperature and atmospheric pressure. The rockets being used for the mission are two Terrier Improved Malamutes, two Terrier Improved Orions, and one Terrier Oriole. The Atrex launch window extends from March 14th through April 3rd, so it really depends on the weather. But uh, if it all goes well, March 14th at 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time um, is the possibility of the beginning of these launches. And again, they are going to just take place over a less than a five minute period. They are at night, so you know people will probably not be able to see the tracers, probably will not be able to see the Milky Way clouds, but they may be able to see the um, rockets take off. Uh, they did hold a um, teleconference today at 1 o'clock, it's March 7th, and I listened to that and I will probably add a little bit of that to this entire video. Um, some interesting questions were raised. A lot of the folks that called into that teleconference just kind of didn't even ask questions. But anyway, going on, the Space Agency will broadcast the three Atrex launches online live with coverage beginning two hours before the opening of the launch window. And they give a link where you can watch the launches and um, <clears throat> again, I'll post the uh, link to this article below. The reason I'm bringing this up is I had actually seen a recent video where uh, it was mentioned that back in June of 2006, NASA admitted to having flown a similar type of rocket with tracers up into the atmosphere. Now this article doesn't tell you, and I had to do some research to find it, but the tracers contain trimethyl aluminum. This is where I found the information on what will, will be contained in those chemical tracers that the rockets will be spitting out. This is Schrodinger's Tiger 
the Clemson University Physics and Astronomy Newsletter that was put out in fall of 2011. Within this newsletter is an article, The HX Experiment, Jet Streams in the Earth's Geospace Region. And they explain why the, um, they're doing the experiment. They have a nice little map of the launch and where the rockets will be landing. And so, sort of the trajectories. Um, and here they talk about the HX scheduled for launch from NASA Wallops Flight Facility on the eastern shore of Virginia in March of 2012. And then this last paragraph says the chemical tracer used in this experiment is trimethyl aluminum, a chemical that reacts with oxygen and produces chemiluminescence <laughs> when exposed to the atmosphere. The products of the reaction are aluminum oxide, carbon dioxide, and water vapor, which also occur naturally in the atmosphere. So that's where I got the information that trimethyl aluminum, also referred to as TMA, is what is going to be in those tracers. The NASA article did not mention that. I'm back on another site that is um, referring to the same ATREX rocket um, launch. I just wanted to show this one because it does have a <laughs> interesting little movie here which shows uh, where the rockets are launched from and they're traveling at different distances and the way they expect the plumes to go. Um, which I thought was kind of interesting. I believe this plays and it's very short. Yeah, maybe it doesn't play. Apologize for that. But uh, I kind of got a chuckle out of their title, Launch Madness at Wallops in March 5 and 5. The article that's here is basically the same thing that I read to you before. And, oh, by the way, um, they did add some pictures here, which are four TMA trails from a prior mission flown from Poker Flat, Alaska in February 2009. So now we have three references to rocket-launched tracers of TMA. We have the 2006, we have a 2009, and now this is the third one in March of 2012. I do believe there have been others. I haven't found all the documentation, but three is good enough for my presentation today. So far, no one has talked in any of these articles about what kind of effects trimethyl aluminum has on the atmosphere, the oceans, or living things. That was a concern of mine. So I went and looked up the uh, material safety data sheets on these. Now, someone might say, why bother looking into what those chemicals do? There's two reasons. One is that even though these are being released pretty high up towards the ionosphere, eventually the particulates do come down. The second reason is TMA is one of the chemicals that is used in geoengineering, which is now being called climate remediation. Um, and is used on a daily basis. Those of us that know about chemtrails, watch chemtrails, see our sky is turning milky white, we're well aware of the milky clouds that form. And if you watch my weather shares from March 7th, um, I did three different ones, and um, it, it's just incredibly obvious. But I think it's important to know about TMA um, and aluminum and what kind of effects that they have on us. Not only the TMA, but the byproducts of TMA. Once it is released into the atmosphere, what it does produce. So, we'll talk a little bit about that.
before I get into the um, particular aspects of uh, TMA, I did just want to mention that this is the article that was put up by a YouTuber that got me kind of following this whole thing. Um, I'd read this, and then I and this is back from June 2003. Um, I'd read this, and then I heard about the launch that's happening next week. So it it got me curious and researching. This is uh, NASA science NASA science news. And it talks about night clouds and glowing white nighttime clouds being visible from the eastern seaboard. So this is again um, showing you some pictures of the tracers and what they did back in June of 03. I um, believe this was also out of Wallops. Yes it was out of Wallops flight facility. And here's a nice little picture of the uh, ionosphere and where different things fly and the height at which the rockets are going to be in which is the above the E layer pretty high up. Um, there's one of the rockets and <laughs> if you wanted to you could click on this and listen to a streaming audio which does just read the article to you. But I wanted to point that out. This was actually the story that got me started on this whole video project. This here is a material safety data sheet or MSDS for trimethyl aluminum. This one happens to be published by Epichem and you can find this MSDS published by various companies. Um, it's uh, just a standard in the industry when you, ever, when you are using substances which could be toxic or might not be toxic but require special handling. It has to do with safety. So this is for trimethyl aluminum. Okay, and I'm going to just point out a couple of things. I'm obviously not going to read this whole thing, but um, it's not a very friendly type of chemical. Prompt medical attention is required in all cases of exposure to trimethyl aluminum and its byproducts. The byproducts were something I wanted to address. Uh, right here, they list the byproducts. Um, just a little clearer if I go down here. Here we go. Stability and reactivity. So what this does, this chemical does, is it reacts pyrophorically in air. In other words, it explodes. It is stable indefinitely in an inert atmosphere at room temperature. Materials to avoid is water, air, or other oxidizers. And the hazardous decomposition products, that is, the products that are going to be produced when this stuff gets released into the atmosphere are aluminum oxide dust, carbon monoxide, and carbon dioxide. And the only other thing I'm going to point out is that it there's conflicting information. In this particular MSDS, it says the product does not contain any class 1 or class 2 ozone depleting chemicals. Well, I thought carbon dioxide was considered an ozone depleting chemical. And so that's what they've been telling us. Um, the other MSDS, I'm going to pull that one up, is uh, another company. Put this one out. This is Praxair. And uh, they're a pretty large company. And uh, right on the front page, danger, pyrophoric, flammable liquid and vapor. Ignites on contact with air. Harmful if inhaled or swallowed. Because eye, skin, and respiratory tract track burns. Etc. Etc. And yes, I will backtrack and say this is being released way up in the atmosphere. People aren't going to be around to be inhaling it as it is in its TMA form. So I do just want to mention <laughs> that it is it is a pretty nasty chemical. Of potential environmental effects, none known. Hmm, okay. And this first aid measures if you happen to come in contact directly with TMA. Firefighting measures, handling and storage. 
you uh, have to be very careful and go around it. Um, this particular one I'm trying to find. These are supposed to be standard MSDSs. Um, it's just not always easy to find what you're looking for in it. Stability and reactivity. Um, ecotoxicity, no known effects. And again, no class 1 or class 2 ozone depleting chemicals. Um, so that's just kind of a quick overview of TMA. In it does say, again, hazardous decomposition products are aluminum oxide dust, carbon monoxide, and carbon dioxide. They state that they are hazardous. parties in conference, including you. Okay. Uh, we'll skip James. Come back to him. Uh, Discovery Channel News. Irene? Uh, thanks very much. Um, I wanted to know how long this uh, chemical is going to stay uh, in the atmosphere and beyond, I guess. It's uh, going up to 200 kilometers. And also, are you? Uh, is it going to be detectable by anything other than these uh, three camera sites that you mentioned? Let's see. The, uh, the chemical is visible to the naked eye. Um, you know, people will be able to see it. it uh, they can also photograph it uh, pretty easily. But yeah, as far as what the chemical produces, uh, the reaction that produces as uh, reaction products that includes aluminum oxide, uh, H2O, and CO2. Now the, the aluminum oxide may seem a little bit unusual, but um, the region up there is actually full of metals uh, deposited by meteorites. Okay, so this is a very small fraction of what occurs naturally. How long will it? How long will it last? Kind of tracking. Um, we'll be able to see it for ten to thirty minutes. That's what it typical. I mean, it's still up there, but uh, it just becomes so faint that it won't be detectable. Folks, all the way up. Uh, New England would be able to see it as far north as New England. Hey, good, Ari. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't really, I didn't hear the the uh, response to the lifetime of the chemical. And the other the other follow up was if if it's going to be tracked or detectable uh, for your purpose of the science experiment by anything other than the three cameras you'd mentioned. It's really only detectable visually, or yeah, just with normal cameras. But there's no special instrumentation. But uh, if we photograph it from three locations, uh, we can use triangulation to uh, determine how it moves, and also to uh, see the structure in the triangle, so we can see the turbulence. The, the lifetime, um, and to be honest, I'm not quite sure that it's very long. Yeah, the um, metals that are usually deposited up there by meteors um, take fractions of a year to uh, settle out. Thank you. Okay, uh, Mr. To 
TMA a bit more and its byproducts and their toxicity. But I thought it might be a little bit better to just educate folks on some of the activities that are taking place. They're really taking place out in the open, but nobody um, knows much about it because it's not advertised. This is a report out of the Bipartisan Policy Center's Task Force on Climate Remediation Research, and I believe it was published in the last couple of months. I'm looking for a date at the moment, and it's not on this page. That's okay. I'll get the date in a second. <clears throat> it's a Bipartisan Policy Center, and it's got a lot of different members from science, and I will show you that list in a second. I did want to mention that they've been using the word climate remediation rather than geoengineering. I think geoengineering is beginning to get a bad name. Um, more people know about it. And so if they call it climate remediation, well, maybe they're steering people away from geoengineering. If you do a search for geoengineering, you might not find this document at any rate. This is a National Strategic Plan for Research on the Potential Effectiveness, Feasibility, and Consequences of Climate Remediation Technologies. I will tell you, after reading through this document, this report, it um, doesn't really assess what the risks and consequences are to climate remediation. I'm not going to go through the list of the members um, in detail of who's on this task force. Um, you can pull up this document yourself. It, it's primarily people that are scientists, senior scientists, directors of different um, science departments at various universities, uh, and including Harvard. Um, and, but one thing I did want to note that there are a number of people who are also um, have political ties such as um, Stephen Rademacher, who's a former Assistant Secretary of State, and um, we have, of course, a member of DARPA, David Victor. I'm sorry, he's not the one on DARPA. <laughs> the one on DARPA is David Will Whalen, PhD. And he's also on the Boeing Defense, Space, and Security uh, panel. He's a vice president, actually, at Boeing, one of our big aerospace companies. And he is a former director of the Tactical Technology Office of the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, also known as DARPA. Some of us will be familiar with that. I'm going to point out this other person here, David Keith, and uh, he is a professor of applied physics at Harvard. And I'm going to put in a little clip after this, which is from one of his speeches at a geoengineering conference. And you'll see why when you hear the clip that I am pointing him out. And this document, just uh, to give you a quick overview, um, what it addresses are two primary methods of climate re remediation. One is solar radiation management. I don't want to get to that. I just need to locate it. <clears throat> one is solar ra radiation management, and one is controlling the release of um, here it is, carbon dioxide dioxide removal technologies. So for example, you know, smokestacks that spit out a whole bunch of carbon dioxide um, need to have filters put on them. So those are technologies that reduce the carbon dioxide um, that goes out, but, uh, and, and also removes the carbon dioxide from the things that are coming out of smokestacks. That's just one example. The other big portion of climate remediation is solar solar <laughs> radiation management techniques. That is something I think we're seeing a lot more of. That has been in place for quite a long time. And this is a good picture that shows, I've seen this before, and it shows 
various ways of remediating the climate and the purpose of which per this document is to manage um, global warming basically uh, that's the purpose that's been stated so what is being used for solar remediation aerosols in the stratosphere to reflect sunlight to prevent warming giant reflectors in orbit have been proposed that would reflect sunlight chemicals to save the ozone I'm not really sure what that's uh, going to be used for except maybe solar remediation cloud seeding of course to bring rain to dry areas uh, growing trees which um, they absorb carbon, carbon dioxide of course and put out oxygen and there's other ways of um, carbon dioxide removal and one is to pump it into rocks that's an interesting concept or pump it into the deep sea that's another interesting concept iron fertilization of the sea is another um, idea that's out there and I believe that is in order to reduce certain um, types of algae and plankton that we do, that uh, put out CO2 <clears throat> so this is kind of a big picture of um, various climate remediation proposals and, and these aren't all of them if you look at other documents you'll find more um, one of the things that I did want to mention is they've specifically listed genetically engineered crops now why would that be here that would be here for a number of reasons first of all if you reduce the sunlight to anything that's growing you're reducing its ability to grow any plant needs some amount of sunlight to grow properly and healthy now if you dumping chemicals through cloud seeding through our aerosols in the atmosphere and you're polluting the soil trees and other things are not going to grow well crops aren't going to grow well that's already happening so what do we do we genetically engineer crops I'm sure some of you have heard of genetically modified organisms or genetically engineered organisms genetically engineered seeds these are all being created so that crops can be planted and food can grow in these conditions that are being created through these geoengineering or climate remediation efforts so I wanted to get this out there and it again this this is a report that's available to anybody who wants to take the time to read it I'm still trying to find the date but it was it's very recent it was either late last fall or it was in January it was released well, it says here that the report is um, conclusions of the task force that was convened in March of 2010 but this this is actually a very recently published document so um, bringing that to your attention uh, take a look at it and you can see that you know we have task forces out there that are affiliated with universities affiliated with some big business and affiliated with the government uh, that are overseeing this stuff um, I wanted to next bring you to the Agriculture Defense Coalition. Remember I talked about how all this geoengineering is affecting crops. This Agriculture Defense Coalition was put out by Rosalind Peterson, I believe, and she has thousands and thousands of PDF documents out here that are government documents that are scientific reports um, that are it's just an uh, astounding amount of information I recommend it people go to this link and really the goal of the agriculture defense coalition they're dedicated to protecting agriculture our water supplies trees and pollinators 
from a wide variety of experimental weather modification and atmospheric testing programs, toxic chemicals, geoengineering, and other experiments. And this is, this is really happening. I mean, this stuff is happening. If you go to any of her links, um, or go to the geoengineering one, uh, this particular one has um, a great video on it, and I recommend watching it. It's a little bit long, but it's Rosalind Peterson who does a presentation at a 2011 geoengineering conference. <clears throat> she also includes her PowerPoint, a link to her PowerPoint on here. And uh, she explains, and it is really very simple, if you reflect the sunlight away from the earth by adding cloud layers, what you're actually doing is warming the earth because then you can't have radiational cooling. I've known since I was a child that it gets freezing cold here in New England in the winter on clear nights because of radiational cooling. The heat from the earth goes off out into the atmosphere. If you have a cloudy night, it stays warmer. So it just makes sense that clouds are going to keep the heat in. You're not going to stop global warming by putting more clouds in the sky. <laughs> you may be reflecting sunlight, but you're not going to stop global warming that way. So anyway, I do recommend, you know, going on a rant. I apologize. Didn't want to do that. But I do recommend going out to her site, checking out what she has here. Uh, she has a section on weather modification as well. And in that page in particular, there are, um, this is where you find thousands and thousands of links, uh, one of the places you find thousands and thousands of links that go back in history um, many years. <coughs> and uh, the one last thing I'm going to bring, about, bring up about the Agriculture Defense Coalition as I was poking around here, there is a section on what the Navy is doing with um, their sonar and live weapons testing in the oceans. I know this doesn't really have anything to do with the rockets that I mentioned, but it does have to do with what's going on with geoengineering. And I did want to make this information known to people, especially those that don't want to take the time to go out here to this particular website and look. They have um, actually ha got a uh, petition and um, that was sent out to the White House on here. And uh, there's a link to the U.S. Navy website regarding the issue. Um, there's also a very interesting, um, I'm not going to bring this up fully. I, this can be opened in a separate page. This is the Navy's five-year warfare testing range complexes, uh, and it shows map of the U.S., and this is based in um, statements made in 2010 on where testing is going to be taking place. And all the little boxes you see along the shorelines of the U.S. are areas where they will be doing sonar experiments as well as weapons testing. And just take a note that there's a long list of toxic chemicals that will be put into our waters. Um, and the Air Force, of course, also has a series of ranges which include um, bombing and other sonar exercises in our oceans. And, you know, you hear news about dolphins in at Cape Cod, which that's, I live in Massachusetts and Cape Cod is close to my heart. And when I heard about all the dolphin strandings and people didn't understand why or know why, well, if you take a look at the map, there's an area that is, you know, used by our military for testing. Marine mammals are very sensitive to sonar. They're very sensitive to the chemicals. And we're killing off our oceans. There was a letter to NOAA that was put together by a couple of senators and a congressman. And I will read that quote that went to NOAA. The Navy plans to increase the number of its exercises or expand the areas in which they may occur, and virtually every coastal state will be affected. 
Some exercises may occur in the nation's most biologically sensitive marine habitats, including national marine sanctuaries and breeding habitats. In all, the Navy anticipates more than 2.3 million takes, significant disruptions in marine mammal foraging, breeding, and other essential behaviors per year, or 11 point million takes over the course of a five-year permit. And this is also important. This is a statement I'm sure that Rosalind added to this little poster, if you will that no government agency is protecting the public interest, and it is time for the U.S. Congress to act, hold congressional hearings, and protect our oceans, all marine life, and public health. This is just one more aspect of geoengineering I really wanted to bring to this video, even though I started out talking about rockets. <laughs> the Agriculture Defense Coalition is a great place to go if you need information, if you want information to share with people, um, there's articles from very simple to very complex scientific articles out here, and I do recommend that you visit this. This is um, kind of made me chuckle. This is a organization, an organization called Solar Radiation Management Governance Initiative. So obviously, solar radiation management needs some governance. I would say so. There are just several documents out here, and I really didn't go into a lot of detail, but I was scanning through it, and um, they talk about who this uh, SRMGI is supported by, and here are some of the supporters of it. The Royal Society, which is the United Kingdom's National Academy of Science, the Environmental Defense Fund, PWS, which is based in Italy, the Fund for Innovative Climate and Energy Research, or FICER, I guess we call it, and I do want to mention that grants for this for research were provided to the University of Calgary from gifts made by Mr. Bill Gates, who does happen to have a major interest in geoengineering as well as some other things one won't discuss now. To my fellow concerned citizens, if we are ever going to stop geoengineering, we need to know as much about it as possible. For those of you who do not know what geoengineering is, it looks like what you're seeing on your screen right now. This is David Keith of the University of Calgary. David Keith is probably the most prominent person in the geoengineering arena. He has testified before the United States Congress on the issue of geoengineering and advises them as to the technical aspects. Let's watch a one minute video clip of what this man has to say. There's no question that large scale climate engineering is untested and dangerous. We've mostly thought about sulfur and there's a lot of good reasons to think about sulfur because Sulfur is what uh, uh, nature does, and there are very good reasons to think we would like to start very slowly if we ever wanted to do this and do something that was an analog to nature because we have some idea what the downsides of what nature does are. Nevertheless, there might be some good reasons to think about alumina. The big deal really is that alumina has four times the volumetric rate of forcing it for small particles as does sulfur, and that means you have four times the surface area for the same rate of forcing, and this is a much bigger deal, you have roughly 16 times less the coagulation rate, and that's the thing that really drives removal. So you could get away, we think, with much smaller mass fluxes, but we haven't run those studies yet, so that might be wrong. This is another document off the uh, Agriculture Defense Coalition website. This was one of the handouts that uh, Rosalind Peser Peterson had brought when she did her uh, speech at the Geoengineering Conference in 2011. This specifically addresses solar radiation management. I'm going to read just a little bit of it to you. Let me read the whole thing. The U.S. House, Tech the US House Science and Technology Committee, three U.S. House hearings, and the U.K. House of Commons in England held separate meeting hearings in 2009 to 2010. 
and are working together to initiate additional geoengineering experiments under proposed global geoengineering governance rules, which exclude public debate, participation, knowledge, consent, or oversight. Solar radiation management equals reduction of direct sunlight reaching the Earth. I just explained that with that picture I showed you. Today, any government, government agency, university, private citizen, city, state, county, private corporation, anyone may modify or mitigate our atmosphere or weather without your knowledge, oversight, or consent. We invite everyone to look up and take notice of the atmospheric geoengineering experiments going on in our skies. Man-made changes in the weather and climate and weather modification programs are listed below here. These are the programs that she has all the documentation for on her website. And she talks about there are increases in human health problems such as asthma, eye and skin irritation, raspy throats, listen to me, <laughs> pneumonia-like symptoms, and more. Many toxic chemicals and particles are released. There's increases in molds, mildews, and viruses. There's a lack of vitamin D and associated health human, human health problems that go with that. Uh, reducing sunlight reduces the solar panel power production. There's a decline in tree and plant health. There's increasing acid rain, air, soil, and water pollution. Why are the trees dying or declining in your area? By the way, the... Uh, western section of the country is experiencing a lot more of this experimentation and a lot more of the decline in terms of trees dying. Jet fuel and rocket emissions from geoengineering experiments increase air, water, and soil pollution, changes in soil pH, and increase health problems and crop damage. Reduced photosynthesis equals lower crop production and de increases declines in tree health. Increasing acid rains, air, soil, and water pollution from geoengineering experiments. Negative effects on biodiversity and oceans, like the ocean iron fertilization I mentioned and other experiments. Uh, another handout she put out there, this is from here, and it's not a whole lot different except that she uh, also talks to the specific uncontrolled geoengineering experiments. And what she means by that is there really isn't any input by the people who are being affected by this. <clears throat> There's intentional and experimental weather modification programs and experiments. Upper atmosphere experiments using rockets and airplanes. That's what I started my presentation out with. The rockets. NASA particle and chemical release experiments, CRRES. Barium, strontium, lithium, calcium, SF6, sulfur hexafluoride, and other ionized ionospheric experiments using rockets, man-made cloud experiments, water vapor experiments, cloud whitening experiments. There's the U.S. Navy and NASA charged aerosol release experiment, CARE from 2009, which I mentioned earlier, using rockets to release an atmospheric aluminum oxide dust cloud over the east coast of the U.S. So next uh, March 14th, that will be the third at least third documented one that's been found of the Air Force and NASA doing this on the East Coast. And then there's aluminum coated fiberglass releases or chaff which is dumped by all branches of the US military in the tons. Now Rosalind Peterson did not make all this up. She has done a lot of research um, and she is a scientist and you know the stuff this stuff is, is out there. It's out there for you to find. You go out to this website and I, I'll just scroll down quickly. Okay, so not okay. Um, these are all PDF documents. She doesn't link to things. She goes and gets them and she saves them as PDF 
so these links will always be available. And they are government documents, uh, scientific articles, some non-scientific articles, just like I'm not even halfway down the page and you can see how many links are on this. So I, I just, I can't stress enough, if you want to know more, go out here. Well, I started out this video just talking about a rocket launch and got into more about solar radiation management, climate remediation, geoengineering, and even into some of our military's actions that are literally destroying our world. And I put this picture up as a reminder that we all hold up the world. And these are mostly children's hands. And if we care about our world and we care about our children, we have to do something. I could have put a lot more in this video, but I didn't want it to turn out as long as it has. So I'm not going to put a lot more into this. But I want to say that I hear people all the time talk about when they point out the chemtrails in the sky that people don't believe them. Um, they don't. People, people don't even see what the problem is. And what I would say to that is share this video. Do some research. Go out to the Agricultural Defense Coalition's website and learn. Go sign that petition. Share information for our children's sake and for the Earth's sake. What can you do? You know, I say it myself sometimes. What can I do? An airplane's flying at 45,000 feet and he's spraying and I can't do a DM thing. Pardon my French. What can I do? I say that to myself often. But we really can do something. We can start our own letters, our own petitions. We can get signatures. We can send them to our legislators, to Congress, to the White House. If you're not in the U.S., you can send it to your own government agencies. And if you believe that you cannot make a difference, then you will not make a difference. But there are 7 billion people in this world. 300 million in the U.S. alone. 300 million plus. Just imagine if half of the people in the U.S., 150 million, were to send letters and petitions to those in government and just bombard them with how you feel about what is going on and that it needs to stop. That we need to stop poisoning the planet and every living creature on it. Just imagine what that might do. We might be surprised. Find out we can make a difference. <clears throat> I'm going to share another site that people can go to it's called aircraft.org and it's, um, I find it a little bit more amusing. There are videos out there. Um, chemtrail evidence, which I don't need chemtrail evidence. I see it every day. There's news, events, health impacts. And I like this site only because it does provide um, easy to read information, you know, plus a how you can help button. Um, which I think leads you to 
uh, different ways aside from donating to them how you can make a difference and actually they do some of what I say contact your local and TV news stations send letters to your congressmen and governors make videos post them on YouTube get a Twitter account and tweet that I just saw a chemtrail over Santa Monica today why isn't Governor Brown doing something hashtag chemtrails something like that you know and it's really going to take critical mass that means a lot of people to do something one person alone is like one little grain of sand on the beach but everybody can really make a difference but a lot of people have to participate so that's my plug my rant after finding out that NASA is going to send up rockets just south of me in about a week and put more crap in the air thank you for watching my video the links to all of these pages that I presented will be below um, I have some information saved by PDF so if you try to get to any of the links I post and they're not gone just uh, leave a message and I will try to get that information to you if I have saved it and please share feel free to copy and spread this as far and wide as you wish